I honestly don't know how many people know that I'm a DACA recipient. Sometimes it's hard to even tell your coworkers. COVID came around and we all thought it was gonna be like a short break from normal life. Si uno de nosotros nos enfermáramos, pues no sabríamos cómo cubrir nuestros gastos médicos. We're afraid to get public assistance. We're afraid to get anything that can be considered public charge. My name is Mary Akili and I'm 17 years old. I'm a senior at Fort Morgan High School. I grew up in West Africa, Benin. I knew I didn't want to stay in Africa, but then I realized that I had to leave all my family behind and all my friends. And my parents got a job here and it was a better opportunity. Most of the immigrant kids growing up, you had to translate for your parents. I feel like you kind of have to pick up the pace if you don't know English, if you come to like a new country with a new language, like you have to like, go, go, go. <laughs> Fort Morgan is very diverse. One of the biggest jobs that brings people here is Cargill and Loprino, those factories. And that's what brings more of the immigrants, the people of color here. But if you look around Fort Morgan, we're not together. If you look around where people live, you can see people of color, like Mexicans or Latino people. In one area, you can see the African. In one area, you can see the white part of Fort Morgan. So we are diverse, but we're not together. <laughs> My name is Ana Agustin Salgado, and it's been about 21 years since I got to the U.S. Now that I'm older, I think about it, and I'm like, why did we have to cross the desert? Because I remember clearly. And we're with our parents. Getting a status, it's not easy. It's time consuming, and it's so pricey. If it wasn't for DACA, I probably wouldn't be working at a clinic. Yeah, I'd be working, absolutely. But I'd be nowhere I really would want to be. At my work, I honestly don't know how many people know that I'm a DACA recipient. Sometimes it's hard to even tell your coworkers. I have to really put that fear aside and be like, no, I'm here to work just like you guys are, and I'm here to stand up for myself, and I want to do even extra work than everybody. I'm so proud because I've been able to help patients. My role as an enrollment representative is the initial, so I get them registered. They come in with nothing, no ID, no coverage. That's what I do. I, I look at the options. I speak to them and tell them they're safe here, and when they know they're, they're hearing that from someone like them, I think it gives them trust and more uh, comforting place to be at. I'm proud of the clinic. I'm proud of the work they do. Honestly, I'm pretty sure they're saving half of Pueblo with their services they offer. My name is Greta. And I'm Israel. Israel. <laughs> I was born right outside of Chicago. Before I moved to Telluride, I lived for two years in Argentina, uh, where I learned to speak Spanish. Yo nací en un pueblo se llama Cihuatlán, en Jalisco. Yo venía desde desde Jalisco, venía directo a, aquí a Telluride. Aquí estoy ya por casi 17 años trabajando en Telluride. 
Me gusta mucho el trabajo de ahí donde estamos ahorita en la cocina. Es, bueno, a mí me gusta. In 2017, I uh, got a job at a restaurant here in Telluride. Israel was working in the kitchen. From the first day I saw him, I thought, oh, who's this? <laughs> ya empezó a decir palabras en español y yo dije, ah, habla español. Y ya empezamos como a conversar más. ¿no? Coquetear. <laughs> <laughs> y así empezó todo. We got married in 2018 and this July, yeah, we will have our first child. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, we became a family. He make me so happy and there's no one else in the world I want to have the rest of my life with. When we became a couple, I knew that I wanted to go through the process because I want Israel to be welcomed into this country. But at that time, I had no idea what the, the process actually entailed. It's complicated, it's expensive, um, it's, it has a lot to do with luck. Every paper that you submit is anywhere from $80 to $500 to $900. We know that eventually we have to go to Mexico and wait. And the lawyer said it could be anywhere from a year to two years. You make one tiny mistake on one of these applications and you can just be denied. Immigration is now for wealthy people. I'm completely bilingual, but I'm doing this in Spanish because that's the language of my heart. Mi nombre es Esperanza Saucedo Durán y vivo aquí en Pueblo Colorado. He vivido aquí, ya voy para 32 años que llegué de México. Mi mamá nos trajo porque venía huyendo de violencia doméstica. Mi papá era muy violento con ella y la quería matar, entonces pues ella decidió traernos para acá. Papi. He mirado que mucha gente hispana se está enfermando de, del COVID. Si uno de nosotros nos enfermáramos, pues no sabríamos cómo cubrir nuestros gastos médicos. Si fuera por causa del COVID, podríamos aplicar para el Medicaid de emergencia, pero eso tampoco es garantizado porque lo tiene que firmar un doctor. Es, me preocupa mucho que vayamos a perder nuestros trabajos, ay, que se vaya a enfermar que le vaya a pasar algo. Si él se enferma, pues no vayamos a tener con qué pagar nuestras cuentas porque nosotros pues desafortunadamente no calificamos para ningún beneficio. Nosotros no calificamos para ese cheque de estímulo porque pues nosotros no tenemos papeles, ni a nuestros niños tampoco se lo dieron. Creo que es una injusticia porque pues todos pagamos taxes. Nuestros niños son ciudadanos americanos y yo creo que tienen derecho. Yo pienso que alguna de las soluciones sería que hubiera cobertura médica para todos nosotros, que abrieran un programa en donde nos dieran la oportunidad de calificar para cobertura médica aunque tuviéramos que pagar una cuota. From the day that the governor of Colorado closed the restaurants, we have been without jobs. I did get unemployment, but um, because where we are in our, you know, an immigration case, Israel tr working for 14 years in the same restaurant still can't apply for unemployment. I had said, but it's going to be okay because we're going to get this stimulus. I went to the IRS website. I read if you're in a family with a person that is not a U.S. citizen, then everyone is denied. And I thought it was a joke. I couldn't believe it. And it's not just us. It's thousands and thousands of families, families that can't get food on the table for their kids. You know, the economy, we millions of people out of work, and that's what the CARES Act was about, right? But why are you saying, okay, you're okay, you can get this, but you're not?
<laughs> COVID came around and we all thought it was gonna be like a short break from normal life. And it kept going, the cases kept rising. And it was hard because some parents had to think, do I have to, do I want to go to work because I need to get, I need to pay bills? Or do I want to risk my kids' lives, my, my spouse's lives? Both my parents worked. My mom worked for um, the nursing home. She would warn me, she'd like, there'll be days if I get it, I might not come home. It's just kind of hard because thinking that some families really have to think about that and how they might not come home for their families. My dad worked at Leprino and cases start rising and I was about to tell him like, just don't work there anymore. Like we'll, we'll make it work somehow. I don't know if he had COVID, but he was just sick. He quarantined himself for two weeks. I was diagnosed with cancer about two years ago. I didn't tell my parents. I was going to my appointments alone. Before my surgery, all I did was pray and I wasn't scared. I said that if I was meant to be okay, I was gonna be okay. And if I was meant to go, then I was gonna go. I have my son to think about and I have this little girl, so I have to really think of what's best for them. I don't know if he can come back. I tell my son, I don't know if I'm gonna wake up tomorrow, son. And I know he's so little to know about these things, but we have to be realistic. I have to be realistic, you know? COVID has impacted me and my family drastically this year. Due to my um, health, I was ordered by my doctor to stay out. I kind of had a pretty much beggar to put me back to work because our bills don't pass. My fiance, he got sick and he got diagnosed with the virus in July. Then we had to be quarantined again for about another month. My income dropped drastically. Um, I was pretty stressed and I was like, what am I gonna do, you know? Cuando estoy ayudando a la comunidad, a las familias, y empezamos a platicar, pues sus preocupaciones creo que son las mismas, que se vayan a enfermar, que vayan a perder sus trabajos, no tienen dinero, cómo cubrir uh, gastos médicos. Yo he mirado que desde febrero las cosas han empeorado bastante. Casi mayoría de las personas que, con las que yo he hablado, uh, su primer pregunta es, ¿y esto es carga pública? Entonces, les da bastante miedo siquiera buscar un poco de ayuda porque tienen miedo que va a llegar inmigración o que si están arreglando sus papeles les vaya a perjudicar en, en su proceso. No quieren aplicar para ningún beneficio de gobierno por, por el miedo. The law that they changed in February about the public charge, they have the option or they have the right to deny us no matter what. We're afraid to get public assistance. We're afraid to get anything that can be considered public charge. There's families that are sick and that won't go to get tested because they're afraid that they could be considered a public charge. How's that gonna get COVID, to make COVID better? I, don't know. I think health is the most important thing in this world and sometimes we we take it for granted. Equal health, it should be for everybody. Patients, they can't afford it. You know, they stop their medications because they can't afford it. Personally, I know a lot of immigrants are undocumented patients. They don't drive, they don't have transportation, so they don't go see the doctor. 
the immigrant uh, population, they're always scared about landing in jail or with ICE. They live their lives at work, from work, home, work, home. They're scared, they're scared that we're gonna pass over their information to the police. They don't trust nobody. Multiple times I've broken down like over literally everything that's happened the past like six, 10 months. I like to say that COVID came in at right time because it would have been way worse if we were in school with Black Lives Matter happening and stuff like that. Most of the times in history class, I'm the only black kid and you know, the topic of slavery comes up and like everyone looks at you and then you hear the comments of the kids like joking about it and how like it's not a big deal or like calling each other slaves. This country hates immigrants, black people and women and LGBTQ. Imagine being three of those, identifying as three of those. So it's basically like, you're not wanted here. I want my family to be Me being an American citizen, I've never ever felt discriminated against, or you know, uh, like I have to live in the shadows. And since we've been together, it really gives you a different perspective. How they feel, it's hard. He's in removal proceedings right now. If we don't get him this green card, then he will be deported. I don't, I don't know if I could go through that again. It was really hard when they took him away. <laughs> Sorry. I drove in the middle of winter to Denver. It was eight and a half hours through storms on Vail Pass and I was so nervous that I wasn't gonna get there too late because I only give you one hour. And I made it and I walked in. You can't even touch each other. It's between glass with phones that don't even work good. And it just didn't make sense. He didn't do anything wrong. So that was just really hard. Um, so I don't want him to have to go through that again. I don't want either of us to have to go through that again. <laughs> I got into being an activist from my mother, who's very active in Fort Morgan, like with different organizations, and that's kind of how I got brought into it. Hello. Hi. I was kind of more picking up the justice, the, all those kind of things, because we don't, they don't teach us that in school. They kind of skip over that. Learning about racism, privilege, all those kind of things. And it was a great but harsh awakening. <laughs> oh, thank God you're here. We got boxes for you. I think that a lot of the laws and like the policy that are made are not really geared towards people of color. A lot of the lawmakers are like, well, I don't know what they want. I don't, no one comes to me. If you're gonna be in a position where you're gonna be in charge of a city, you need to be there for the whole town, not just whoever shows up. Me gusta ayudar a la gente, uh, me hace sentir bien. Nunca pensé que iba a poder ayudar de ninguna manera porque, pues, soy de México. A veces sí le da a uno miedo involucrarse con la comunidad cuando uno no tiene papeles. The defense of this statue is made around saying that it is an homage to immigrants and immigration. We know there are no immigrants on stolen land. So here with a message today to speak to the fact that this statue does not represent them, I'd like to introduce you to Esperanza. Hi everyone, um, my name is Esperanza Saucedo and the city of Pueblo says that this statue is about immigrants. I'm an immigrant and this statue does not represent me. Take it down. Cuando empezamos éramos muy poquitas y ahora somos muchas. Estamos creciendo y pienso que vamos a seguir creciendo y vamos a ayudar a más gente.
this way. We're not bad people. We just want to do the right thing. We're just trying to have a good family, have a good life, make a living. We're going to be all right. Even, even though it's hard and it's a long process and sometimes it makes me cry or feel like it's never going to end, we're going to get there. We're going to be okay. We're going to keep working. We're going to figure it out. I promised him that when we can travel, I'm going to take him on our honeymoon to Japan. <laughs> Eat ramen. <laughs> <laughs>